studying somewhere in Berlin at uh, Banker Studio, Carmack Studios. Yeah. And we have a very special um, guest tonight, mm. Kan of Finland. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Oh, it's a pleasure. <laughs> Uh, can we know each other already like a year, I think? Oh, yeah. Uh, but you actually have a pretty long uh, bio, I have to say. You are you, so are you suggesting stuff. I'm old? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I had to do uh, research because I'm kind of ignorant, I have to admit. But you did so many stuff like music, uh, soundtracks, theater, opera, etc., visual arts. How do you see yourself? <laughs> uh, I, I only do it for myself, so it's for my own pleasure. And I enjoy when other people like it too. So it's natural. <laughs> and uh, you also have uh, been living in New York yeah. and been part of the scene there yeah, in this, the 90s. This, this is my skyline here. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. very New York y. <laughs> yeah, I lived in New York from 92 to 2002. Yeah. And I kind of just stranded there. I went to see a friend, my friend Jimmy Tenno. He's also a musician. We met in New York and then we found a place in Brooklyn by uh, these two brothers that owned a synagogue. In it was the, in 92, right? Yeah, yeah. I arrived in 92, May 92, and um, yeah, they, these two brothers, they had a synagogue and a couple of buildings. A synagogue? A synagogue. They were living Are they in... Are private? Yeah, yeah, it was their private synagogue, and they uh, were living in the synagogue because one of the brothers was the artist, okay. and the other one had to do all the work. <laughs> you know, that kind of... That kind of Family, yeah, I've family, heard that before, yeah. family deal. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we just, you know, rented an apartment. Jimmy and his girlfriend at that time, and myself and uh, our cat, Pekka. Okay. It's a Finnish name, you know. I, I met Jimmy in Finland. Okay. Because I used to go and visit my grandmother in Finland. I'm I'm half Finnish. Yeah. So um, I went, you know, whenever I, I didn't have any money, I would call my grandmother. I was like, I need a vacation, I need a vacation. <laughs> and she would send me a ticket. Yeah. So I went to Finland and then I oh, asked her. Boy. <laughs> yeah, and then, I, then I asked Sorry. her to give me money so I could go out because it's so expensive in Finland. And I went to a club called Berlin and that's where I met Jimmy. He okay. was playing there with his band. I think it was called Jimmy Tenor and the Shamans or something. Okay. So I met him and I started talking to him. And uh, he, I think he moved to Berlin for a while. And then we met up in Berlin. And then we met up in New York again. And then we, you know, we rented this apartment because it was, in the end, it was cheaper than um, getting a hotel room or something. Hmm. And then I stayed for 11 years. Not in that apartment, but in what New York. What was it like arriving in New York at such an iconic time, you know? One thing about American series like, I don't know, <laughs> Seinfeld or The ni so, 90s. Portrayed this kind of uh, image of New York. Yeah, but yeah. Seen from outside uh, might be different, you know? No, I think it, it's, it's quite accurate, really. Um, Obviously, it depends on where you live. I think Seinfeld is Midtown. Hmm. I was okay. living. I was living in Williamsburg, which still was kind of very rough and uh, dirty and cheap. You know, kind now no con. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of the same same story. I would say. You know, it's like. Uh, yeah, I mean, Neukölln is one of the most expensive places in in Berlin now, isn't it? Well, yeah, gentrification. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it was mainly a Puerto Rican and Dominican neighborhood Axel, okay. in Williamsburg. And everybody knew us instantly because I was the tallest in the neighborhood and Jimmy was the blondest. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, they knew us and they invited us to little get-togethers and, you know, we started, you know, getting to know the people. Everything was really nice. 
until one day, I remember, we went to a party and uh, somebody asked me, like, <laughs> because I, I told her I was half half Finnish, half Turkish, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know. Um, so I think she was expecting me to be a Muslim or at least to be something not Christian or something. Yes. <laughs> and But when I told her that I don't believe in anything, the whole party stopped, you know. Everything stopped and they never talked to me again. This is like conservative people, but there are also ravers. Something like that. No, no, they're like not ravers. It was, ravers more, it was more of a family party. It was like okay. a family party, and we were invited because we're neighbors. You know, it was like a neighbor party. So you you uh, pinch some like uh, sensitive yes. spot there. Yes, I think I think it's it's more like well, if you don't believe in anything, that's kind of the worst. You can be you could be a Satanist, you could be a Buddhist, you could be a Muslim, uh, whatever, it's fine. At least you believe in God. But that, not that is true. This generates a kind of panic, um, very special, because uh, when people believe in something, they assume, they said the, the robber, the, how do you say, the, the people the, who steal. The thief. The thief. Uh, thinks of everyone else as the same condition of, as him, you know? <laughs> he should, yeah. <laughs> or she should, yeah. yeah. But and I think people expect that you believe at least in something, so they feel identified with this need of having, like, a containing structure. And yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I believe in something. It's not that I don't believe in anything, but if you can you know if it doesn't ha doesn't have a book mm. if it doesn't have if if it's not an official religion that's what they meant like you know i'm not part of anything but not being part of anything is kind of story of my life but you became part of kind of new york underground at the time or slowly or how was this yeah, process? yeah, yeah. i mean um Jimmy and I, we were definitely making music. We wanted to start a band, and I think the band was called Public Ecstasy or something. Interesting uh, choose of words. <laughs> <laughs> and, but we never played. It never really, you know, it never really happened. Jimmy and Tina, uh, they left New York, I think, a year or a year and a half after or two years maybe. We lived in that place for two years and then I, I stayed in New York. I moved to uh, Spanish Harlem first. But this whole, well, this whole religion thing, I mean, it's it's nothing else but, you know, George W. Bush saying you're either with us or, with you know, against us. It's like this, this was later on. the excess of evil. Yeah, you know? exactly. It's like you have to be part of a football game or something. Hmm to to uh, really exist or I don't know you know <clears throat> yeah I see what you I see what you mean that there's something about American culture especially that is very good at producing these stereotypes and reproducing these stereotypes in mass media and in pop culture I mean pop culture yeah, yeah. and um, yeah. since it is a kind of um, uh, in empire at least cultural ways and economic wise, a, lot, a huge part of the world also received these stereotypes as, a, as a, an effect. So. It's export. Yeah, yeah. it's a, a product of... Yeah, yeah. it comes with, the, with everything else. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. And what about this uh, underground New York that you knew, more related to the backstage uh, life of the music, something that was very much alive at the time, let's say? Well, I mean... I came from Germany where, you know, sort of techno was already starting and happening in a way. And uh, when I moved to New York, New York was still very much uh, a house music, you know, New York house kind of club. Right, because the connection Berlin was Berlin-Detroit or exactly, Berlin-Chicago. Yeah, 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 so. yeah, yeah. And New York was way more conservative in that sense you know it, it was still very melodic it was more about you know vocals chords and stuff and for me this whole techno thing was um 
it was it, it came out of, for me it came out of punk you know it was like okay you don't have to play an instrument anymore you can just play with sound it, mm. you don't you know you don't have to play three chords even you know that's pretty much a berliner uh, id is uh, it sign, no yeah. i think like the evolution from punk to techno in that way um, yeah, it's, it's DIY. It's DIY. Yeah, and DIY. It's, it's a network. Also, I mean, you know, you you work with the labels and you work with the artists that are around you, that are your friends, and you know, you support each other. And my friends would put out the records, or I would collaborate with them. And uh, when I was in New York, there was not much infrastructure really. The only really techno record shop that existed was called uh, Sonic Groove, okay. which was in Brooklyn. And it was always this sort of like Brooklyn against Manhattan. Manhattan was house, clubs, chic, awesome. money, coke. And um, Brooklyn was the, the real underground techno rave, dirty. And Brooklyn so had also something to do with the origin of hip hop, or? Um, I think by that time hip hop was everywhere in the states. Right. I think you know, yeah. It was already a decade. Uh, yeah, and it was least. already mainstream. Yeah. I mean, it was already yeah. in the charts and everything. Yeah. So um, I decided to open a record shop in New York. Yeah, and I didn't really have any money, so I asked. Uh, a record label in New York that I, I was working with called uh, Smile, Smile Communication. Yeah. They also, it was a subdivision of, um, was it Priority or something? Pri Priority Records. They had Run DMC. I mean, oh, nice. You know, yeah. Was it Priority or uh, I forgot what it was. But Smile Communication was a subdivision of that label and specializing in, in techno, mostly licensing stuff from Europe, a lot from Germany. So I, I just talked to all my um, contacts in, in Germany and in Europe and asked them to send me their catalog, the whole mm -hmm. backstock catalog, send me all the records you have, I will promote you in New York. And um, I found a place inside a clothing shop, which was called Liquid Sky. I don't know if you know the movie. It rings a bell. Yeah, it's quite a good movie, sort of very psychedelic, surreal, space space movie. Okay. And they took the name from them, and it's a clothing line. It was a clothing shop. So I, I became friends with them, and I asked them to open the record shop inside the clothing store so I would already have uh, customers. They agreed, and uh, I found a really nice uh, Italian interior designer who was looking for not a job because I couldn't pay him, <laughs> but a practicant. He, yeah, he, he no, no, no. He 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 was looking to to build a shop because that would be his uh, business card. You know, he could say like, okay, this is my first work in New York, I, I designed this record shop and, you know, so it, it would go hand in hand. And I opened the record shop, I think, 94. So I was already two years, two, three years in New York. Yeah. And... Uh, they say it take at least two years to adapt to a new city. Like coming to Berlin, I have to say for me, it was definitely more, but... More than two years, yeah. yeah. At least yeah. two years to settle, let's say. Okay, yeah. And, well, I went from there, you know. I the first, I, I made the shop. I hired some people that I knew, you know, like some DJs. And I knew them from going out. And um, when, you know, when everything was ready, I received the first package from, from Europe with records so and officially it, a store then. it was 30 copies of the same record nice. <laughs> so my first day i opened i had 30 uh d jungle fever record i don't know what number it was like number 30 or something it was like kind of like a dark yellow color vinyl 12 inch so i just plastered the whole wall with that record that was a hit i guess no i told people it 
it was a ah, hit. Ah, you made it a hit. Yes, I made it a hit, exactly. This is a thing with <laughs> the record stores, you know, that sometimes they can really have an influence, so especially at the vinyl times. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Or what's being played. It is yeah, a very yeah, interesting, yeah, 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 yeah. like, underground story yeah, yeah. from what happens in the clubs. Exactly, yeah, mm. yeah. And talking about labels... How did you develop? What's your feeling about this kind of label administrator or label industry? Mm. Well, the there's there's that network I told you about, and there's a lot of sort of you know you you give somebody a record and you never see a penny. Mm -hmm. A lot of <laughs> a lot of that. It's sometimes okay because then I would just ask them to give me a record for my label, and then I I wouldn't pay them obviously. Mm -hmm. But I did work with a lot of labels, like, for example, Force Inc., Mil, yeah. Pla Mil Plateau, and all these people. I love all those labels. Yeah, and I mean, th they did pay me, you know. They, yeah. they always paid. Uh, so there are examples of interesting music labels that still Absol are yeah. I don't know viable. If, yeah, they, they actually they reopened now. But, I mean, at that time, there was a lot of interesting stuff because it was less categorized than it is maybe mm. today. I don't know. I mean, you know, there was techno. It was more where the music came from. It was like Berlin techno. Then there was the the Chicago sound. Yeah. There was a Detroit sound. And then there was the English, you know. And you had this kind of expertise in a way because you were coming from Berlin. I knew a lot of stuff, but I also learned a lot of stuff uh, by doing the record shop, you know. Hmm. And uh, I think I learned... D, you know, beat matching and DJing in the shop because I would sit in the shop all day and, you know, yeah. wait for people and listen yeah. to the records and then start mixing yeah. and stuff. And, um, yeah. A friend of mine, Jeremy Caulfield, uh, he said to me once that he learned DJ when he was uh, visiting a friend in Australia and had, like, just the whole day free. And he told me, basically, you just need free time, you know, and yeah. access to a lot of records. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And then you, le you learn beat matching, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's not that difficult, I think, you know. I mean, well, it depends. I mean, some people don't hear the difference between slower and faster. But if you have a musical <laughs> ear, it's, uh, you can learn it quite fast. Yeah. It was fun. It was really fun. I mean, running the record shop was really fun. I learned a lot of stuff because, I mean, I didn't know anything about running a shop, you know, bookkeeping mm. and... You know, I didn't know anything about this. I knew that, you know, it's good to have a record label and a record shop because then you can sell your own product. You can. You just felt that there was something there that would work together. Yeah, that, so. and I think my my dad uh, he had a gas station, so I grew up on a gas station. And oh, really? Yeah. So you learn a lot. The gas of station where? Sorry. Huh? Where the gas station in, in Frankfurt, Finland, in, in Frankfurt. Turke the Türkei, or in, in no, no, no. I mean, you know, I was born in Germany, um, right. in Frankfurt. My father's gas station was in Frankfurt. Wow. My, my father would pick up the phone. I don't know if this works in English, but my last name is Oral, Oral, yeah. And uh, there's another uh, gas company called Aral. I know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, is it is it interna it's international, I guess. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So, I mean, my dad would pick up the phone, he would say, like, Es ist Station Oral. Yeah. Like Aral, but mit o, with O. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and didn't you use that for some artist name? Or some, some record or something, no? Oral? Yeah. I, I was checking uh, today quickly. Uh, I had a band with my brother yeah, something, a billion no? years ah, ago. okay. I think it was called Oral Roadshow or something. I don't know. Uh, but that's on Spotify. But you can't know about no. this. No, no, no. Okay. There's no release. Okay, they, they were just, okay. <laughs> but I mean, you know, I mean, in the end, <coughs> excuse me. In the end, <coughs> running a gas station is not so different <coughs> than running a, a record shop, I guess. I mean, you it's know. pretty much like a small town American background story. What I have. Yeah, I think you had a good chance to integrate good uh, in American society or... In the U.S. or yeah, you mean in Germany? in the U.S. Like, in did the you US. have like a culture uh, clash or... Well, I mean, you know, it's like just because I'm, you know, I'm Finnish, Turkish, German, whatever. I mean, I, I feel quite comfortable wherever I go. 
you know. I, because I'm, you're always weird uh, uh, anywhere. Yeah, or let's, you know, sometimes I feel like, oh, I don't have roots. Like, you know, I, I can't really, I mean, I have roots in different countries and different cultures and different religions in that sense. So you don't really know yourself where you're from or something. So hmm. it has some good sides, for example, that I feel very comfortable with uh, all kinds of people. Uh, and wherever I go, you know, if I, if I like the place, you know, I, I, I feel like I live there already. You mm -hmm. know? So I had no problems in New York. New York was very easy. And in that sense, also, New York's very open. Yeah. Plus, this whole concept of a grid city. It's like, I mean, you go to New York and you instantly know how to navigate in the city. You know, you know, okay, the streets are going up Yeah, this Buenos way. Aires is also a grid uh, okay. city. Okay, it works the same way. Yeah? yeah, I still get lost in Berlin because it's like, yeah. how are these not parallels? But you know? Berlin is the worst because it's a circle. It's Everything like is a ring. You know. Streets go like anywhere, you know. Yeah, there's you always like think you're going in the right <laughs> direction, but then you realize you're actually going. And then there's river also, like cutting the streets so, and canals. Yeah. And so then you came back to Berlin. Well, I stayed, I think, 11 years in New York. Ah, it was a tr And And uh, I also uh, sort of, I signed a deal with Matador Records. Ah, right. In 99, which was... Um, Isn't Luciano also there? I don't Matador? Know. I don't know. Matador is actually they they started. I know that's back up boom. No, I'm they so started confused. as a as a as a real indie rock label. I saw. Okay. And then they got interested into electronic music, and then uh, they called me into the office, and I was like, okay, they probably want to know stuff about electronic music, and uh, we had a meeting, and I was just wasn't sure what they want from me until they told me that they want to sign me and I was like okay of course nice. no problem and they paid really well because they thought you know you need to go into a studio like rock bands need to do but I mean electronic musicians don't really go into studios you know so it was really good money yeah. that I could just put in my pocket Also, the uh, yeah, uh, the extremes happened at this time at the end of the 90s like glitch Yeah. Music, yeah. it started to be a gender, like yeah. uh, Albanotto, for yeah. example, like people that were coming from sound engineering and so yeah. were making this conceptual. Of yeah. course, in a way, Kraftwerk was already that and yeah. so, but this was a special point. And after this point, a lot of genders, genres are, are called post or post music or post rock, you know, yeah. or post dance music or IDM, uh, yeah. you know. Yeah. And so I think it was a turning point in that way. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, maybe this whole electronic thing in that at that time sort of got liberated or emancipated, you know. You think raves had something to do with that? Um, no, I think no? raves were quite separate from from everything. And I mean, you go to a rave to listen to techno music, okay? There, there was a point where festivals, like rock festivals, would invite DJs. True. That's, that's another and thing. And like bands like Underworld that would start as a band, but they would really be like a rave act. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 What, what can you say, like comparing New York to Berlin from your experience? Um, like similar things or connected things? I mean, when I, links. when I arrived in... In, in Berlin in 2002 from New York, I thought Berlin was very white, you know, very... White or white, wild? White. Okay. Very white, you know, like very, not very... Colorful. Colorful, colorful yeah. Oops, well, not. Excuse me. <laughs> um, no, of course. Um, not very colorful. So that changed till now I think do, do you what was the question yeah, like, you, this is your impression you after you came back from New York uh, how, how I re, uh, yeah coming see. back to Berlin yeah um, but still like very gritty I mean at that time it was still very gray it was still gray, gray, gray Berlin gray, gray. I mean yeah. 2002 was still very yeah. gray um, very dark very fun very sleazy I mean it's always been sleazy but um Dirty, dark, and sleazy is kind of, you know... Yeah, 
Yeah, that's how we roll. <laughs> yes, <I guess>. exactly. <laughs> now it's less sleazy, less dirty, still fun. I would say. Is I it? Mean, well, it's hard to say after the last year. I would say, but I mean, you know, fun is. You know, you have to make your own fun, whatever, whatever, wherever, however you are. I think. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I did enjoy this quiet last year, <laughs> sort, of, sort of. I mean, many things changed. You know, I, I, I like change. You know. But do you think that this uh, extended uh, quarantine situation will have a, an effect, or will things go back to normal? Business as usual? No, 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 no. I, I don't think so. I mean, at least for me, that's what I meant. You know, this whole year was, you know, so intense for my head and for 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 my moment of life. You know, I don't know how to say it, but um, I don't know. I'm I'm very. You know, everything got disrupted because of this uh, pandemic and. Um, So you, you you can see all of a sudden you can see both worlds. You know, you see the past and you see the future or you see yourself now, but you, you're sort of detached. You know, I, I felt kind of detached from music business because there was no music business and stuff. And that was really interesting, you know. And hmm. um, What is your idea of the state of music industry right now, like after Corona and so being part of it in a way. Yeah, 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 I mean, you know, I mean the the nice thing is that lately I've been asked to like play in movies and you've been doing soundtracks for a film. Yeah, I've done that as well, but I mean I was acting lately. Ah, it's an, right. Yeah, I was just in Switzerland on Sunday I'm doing something. Yeah. And um I I like I like visuals with sound you know it's also nice for example when you have already something you can put your sound onto you know instead yeah. of like making a track meaning you start with nothing you know i agree so, i also like this um uh, synapses yeah no, synapses no um synesthesia you know synesthesia. like yeah exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. Like combining different orders of things that go together. Yeah. yeah, it's like, you know, there's already a story, there's already a concept. You don't have to like, it's not your thing, it's somebody else's thing and you're contributing to it, yeah. to the to the theater play or to the mm. movie, you know. So I, I enjoy that, you know. And at the same time, uh, I felt completely liberated about my music. I was like, you know, I mean, pff, nothing's going on. Everything is closed. And all the record labels were like, okay, let's hold it. You know, let's wait. Let's see when the record shops open again, blah, blah, blah. And... Uh, I was like, all oh, right, you know, I, I just do music for myself, <laughs> you know, I just do whatever I want to do, you mm. know. So not thinking about a market yeah. or a label or a style, you know, so um, that that was really great. And I But really I mean, I have to say your music seems really liberated already, like your music. I, I, I made electronic music myself, but I always felt like kind of uh, into this um, uh, range of uh, sound, like very uh, techno, artificial and so, but your music, I have to say, like every track has this kind of um, music influence, you know, with capital mm. letters, you can see influence from the history of music and rock and post-rock. Yeah, yeah, I There's mean... There's so many elements there. I know, I know a so, lot of things. Yeah. Because we talked about this already privately and... Um, I, I kind of tripped when you say, like, okay, now you feel more liberated to make music because your music seemed already so fresh. You know what I mean? It I, already I, I was just saying, like, I was sort of liberated from this whole business side of it. Okay. You know, hmm. because there was no business, you know. Hmm. It was it was sort of gone all of a sudden. And um, musically, I was just entertaining myself you know I would I was like you know I could play techno tracks until I was tired of the drum machine and then I started playing guitar and started and singing singing yeah, yeah I really wrote songs which I rarely do but 
like you know fiddling and fi you know figuring out a couple of chords and stuff and what's your feeling on gamma and so this uh, this uh, love hate uh, relationship between the um uh, musician uh, scene Well, GEMA for me is always a source of income. Just know. to clarify, GEMA is the entity that's uh, responsible Collects for money. collecting the um, um, rights. Yeah, from music. the radio, from yeah. television, from the labels, actually, who press the records, like the copyright. And in Germany, it's very, if you want to earn official money with it, it's very important that you are a in, member. You can now. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. But there's, since there was several years ago already in YouTube and so these um, uh, filters for kind of content that was uh, registered and then it went kind of worldwide like this kind of hate against Gema and so and there's uh, I see a small proportion of uh, musicians uh, like represent feeling represented you know what I well, mean well you know it's very simple gema is just collecting the copyright money for the artist or for the publisher if you have a publisher which means um if somebody wants to reproduce my music meaning press records CDs or play it on the radio play it on television they have to pay a cut That's how the artist gets paid. So I don't see why why um, why an artist has a problem with that. Yeah, I mean, if it if this uh, works, then it should be it should make sense. Yeah, yeah there's it, countries it, it like uh, works, yeah. I come from yeah, Argentina. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, considered a third world country or developing country, and most of musicians are better out, let's say, than in, because money is not distributed fairly in a way well yeah than. but i mean if you don't have any records out then yeah. nobody can collect the money you know yeah. if you don't have a if you, if you have a record out you you can find a collector that's collecting your money which also of course means that somebody will knock on the door of the label and say like hey you owe mr blah 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 this amount of money we're going to take 10 percent this did happen and that to might be your friend and yeah. then your friend is pissed off at you because you <laughs> wanted your money that you deserve. So you know. it's a controversial... It's not controversial. Thing, it's like you have to talk about it with your friend or if you have like, you know, a record deal with a record company like EMI, you don't talk about this because it's obviously already. they pay the copyright, you know. True. Hmm. So uh, I think the, the controversial about GEMA was, they, I mean, they also collect money from restaurants, bars, any place that plays music. And uh, uh, a lot of clubs, uh, yeah, you know, complained about that. Uh, I so I don't think the system is very good because they collect a flat fee. Uh, yeah, they are not really checking every time in every event. Well, I know because uh, let, let's put it this way: yeah. the 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 artists that are being played at Berghain, you know, the the the, the records that are played by the DJs are not the, the ones who benefit from the money that the backhand pays. Because right. obviously not the DJ doesn't write down every song he, ha he, he was playing that night or, you know, the whole five, six hundred songs that were played all over the weekend right. or something. No, they just pay a flat fee. That flat fee goes into a big pot. And that part gets divided by the actually best earning artists. So that system is not fair. I totally mm. agree. But, uh, but there but is no other system needed, right now. Yeah, there's, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, wherever I can prove that my music is played or, you know, I, I will get my, my money, you know. And I think they have totally international, um, you know, the... the, the, the It, you know, if my music is getting played in Argentina, mm -hmm. the, the, on the radio, the radio you will, will get pay nothing, it. Probably. <laughs> you know, it will war. It, it takes three years before it ends on my account or something, but it will end on my account. Yeah, and I and appreciate that. Talking about Berghain, yeah. you organize a party there. Well, as I, a host. I, yeah, I hosted the. Also, I yeah. read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've yeah. never been yeah. invited. I have to say, even though we didn't know each other, we didn't know each other at the time, but. You've never been there to Berghain, or what? To your parties at oh, Berghain. Oh, well, that's a while ago. Okay. Okay. But because Berghain is kind of like a myth, and people who've never been 
or neighbor to Berlin. It's had a lot of, I, me myself, even when I was already, I went already there and I was living in Berlin, I still had this preconception. And it was not until last years that I really kind of turned down these uh, preconceptions and kind of understood a bit more what it is or what it was or what it's supposed to be, you know? Yeah. What are your ideas on this construction of a myth and... Of like the, the myth and the legend of Berkheim? Yeah, and versus reality, I mean... Well, hmm, it's a difficult question. It's difficult. <laughs> kind of, I mean... Some well, call it the temple. When I arrived in Berlin in 2002, there was Osgood. The, the club before yeah, Berlin, good, good uh, before back very cool yeah. label. I same, like it same, pe same, same people, you know, same people. Yeah. The, the other club was called uh, Ostgut. And yeah. when I arrived here, we started playing there. And we, we almost, with Captain Comatose, this band that I used to have with yes. Snack, my friends. Captain Comatose. Captain Comatose, yeah. And I mean, yeah, we played there all the time, especially at Panorama Bar. And yeah. it was obviously wild and yeah. great and super fun and you know it was amazing it was really really amazing and then they moved and uh, I still DJed there and then we had this party called Smegma it's a party by uh, Andy Baumecker and Donald Winkler at that time it was I think weekly We did it weekly. <laughs> yeah, you tend to forget sometimes. It's we did it of weekly. I resident think. DJ. <laughs> yeah, story. not for very long, and then we started doing it a monthly, which was much yeah, better because you know I was hosting it, and I think every time I would like sort of at one point open the party with the song, mm. like you know coming down <laughs> from the staircase at Berghain from the top with like a spotlight. I always asked for <laughs> stuff. I mean, I even asked them if I could please fly <laughs> <laughs> on a string once to the whole club and then, like, you know, sing my song. And they were like, no, you can't do They that. say no. <laughs> they this is no. like, they have to stay, stick But they, to this. I think they said no because... Attitude, because like heart, heart, uh, Because it's too difficult. You need, like, fire department and you need all kinds of things. So they were like, no, sorry. <laughs> this is, <laughs> you're asking for too much. <laughs> But too I asked anyways. Diva. Too much diva for Berghain. Or, or <laughs> does it still? Uh, maybe I think I think it, maybe it's a good thing that it didn't. <laughs> and I could have, you know, I, maybe I wasn't here <laughs> if if we did it, you know. Okay, so because there's there's this kind of like upper wiser like uh, so, entity attribute to Berkheim, like some call it the <sighs> temple, yeah. and some because you know alterated states of perception, and so some people. Spend I think then that's when it started to get boring you know? okay <laughs> you know temples is not so my thing you know that's yeah. what i said earlier yeah, you know? i'm not into religions yeah, and exactly. uh, yeah then i don't know yeah yeah beliefs has a lot to do with that even in underground culture even in like contra culture you s always have a belief system yeah. right and mm -hmm. uh, i guess the way of how you went through your lives or the different communities you've been integrated to really shape your way of how to yeah. kind of see through that, you know? I think all this, like, you know, community stuff is, is whatever religion or however this is sort of, like, networked. Everything is fine as long as nobody, you know, starts pointing fingers on other people. Then hmm. the problems start, you know? True. And the party is over. True. Mm. I I believe also this is uh, this might be also a belief system. And I mean that that is isn't that sort of like what religion is saying, you know, they're like saying like, you know, take care of the other and be there for the other. Not every religion, but yeah. But in the end it's always this sort of genre, it's this religion, it's this group that sort of isolates from the others more, you know, more, yeah. more isolate themselves or more, you know, I don't know, you yeah, know, it's yeah. another division no, in totally. so many divisions already, mm. you know, male, female, green, yeah. black, white, uh, you know, yeah. all the divisions, you know, yeah. if, yeah. What's your position on, what's your problem. position on uh, um, the fight against uh, categorization of gender, 
of uh, sex orientation, like making up new words for it, making up new categories. Sometimes it's a form of empowerment, and sometimes it still <laughs> plays the game of yeah. categor no, I, categorizing. I, I, I mean, but it would need to be quite pragmatic, I think, you know, I mean, okay, get rid of all articles, <laughs> just keep the, you know, unisex article, or, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, I mean, it would need to be new designed. Like a universal language kind of, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a bit if, authoritarian. If, if, I'm all stuff. for decategorizing, de de everything. <laughs> Deconstructing, it's like the official political term, let's say. Okay. Like uh, to the uh, heterosexual males that had to get out of the dominant place, they say yeah. we have to deconstruct, you know, which is a Derrida term, actually. It's a yeah. post-structuralism term from the yeah. uh, philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I want to talk... <laughs> Uh, and then we wrap up if you want. But I want to talk a bit about your relation with art. Let's say art with capital letters, not yeah. just music and music industry, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know Philosophy. you have. Yeah, like also as a performer. And uh, I read you had a, a photo book that was part yeah. of a Documenta 13. Yeah. Uh, how was your relationship? How did your relationship with art develop? And where, when, at which point did this yeah, happen? Yeah, music was totally for me. You know, that's that's my art, or I mean, anything. You know, it's just anything really. But that's kind of like the first thing I got into, and where I, you know, realized you can, yeah, you can have different languages or different communications. But I know. met you at the gallery exhibition from yours that had installations. In, in yeah, bedding. you were singing out of the window. <laughs> yeah. It was because already it was corona, quarantine, actually. Yeah. Yeah. No, pe um, five people could go inside. So uh, you are really a, like a multidisciplinary artist. I'm, uh, I'm really like you know, pff, I don't know if this is egoistic or something, but it's like I'm, I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to get as much fun as possible out of everything. You know, I try to get, you know, I try to get myself to get into things. You know. Yeah. Like, I want to be into the music I made, you know. I don't want to be bored by my own music because, you yeah. know, I have to do it, you know, or I have to blah, blah, blah. But you know? you're also continuing Make a doing record. Uh, collaborations. Yeah, but so, in a way, that's, for me, the art, you know. It's like, you know, it's, it's of course, you are your own piece of art, in a way, you know. That's, like, my life, of my way of living my life, you know. Yeah. It's a good... Um, philosophy you know no. it works i think it might work if you can uh, see it like that yeah yeah maybe that's the, the that's my religion or you know that's like yeah. more like what i identify with maybe this know? is why it's a threatening when you are like not believing any of these other okay um, standard structures yeah. you know <laughs> i don't sign any anything <laughs> except you give me money for it then I, okay. sign, then I sign any book. Give me a book, I sign it. But I told you already. I'm a Christian, pay me. You yeah. know, pay me the money, I'll sign any way you I want. I saw some video clips from you I'm, dressed as I'm a I'm already as circumcised, a you know. Is it not true that you were dressed as a nun in a video clip? Yes, yes. Is it everybody is about. Everybody track? is, a, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> why the why the uh, religious a reference? nun with a beard in Berlin <laughs> with Philip I shot the video with Philip. Ah, oh, right yeah, yeah, Philip yeah. Virus is yeah, a yeah. film director a yeah, exactly, director yeah. friend of uh, friend, yeah. us yeah so what's what's your picture for the future my picture for the future oh. Oh. Um, surprises <laughs> surprises I would say you know <laughs> let's see do you have anyone right now, like, like a today? forecast for the Do future? Do you see something? Do you have visions in your dreams? Oh, uh, you know, very basic stuff. You know, like beaches, <laughs> uh, making. You know, I don't know, getting to see the world, getting out. You know. Well, this might, this might change also. We're seeing the world with Corona and with uh, climate change, and so. 
A lot of things are changing very fast in mm. that aspect. We are entering the post-world reality. In the post-world. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you very much for thank being you, here. Thank you, thank I love you. you. Thank you. Love you too. You're the best.